Welcome to the Manly Saints Project with me, Hugh Hunter. If you enjoy my work, please consider signing up and supporting me on Substack, or click the link in the show notes to buy me a beer. And if you enjoy the podcast as audio or video, please consider giving me a rating wherever you are. It helps a lot. Now, let's meet this week's Manly Saint. Join me today to meet a saint who sought out the most evil place he could find to make it his home. Name, Guthlack, Guthlake, Guthlack of Crowland. Life, 673 to 714 AD. Status, Saint. Feast, April 11th. Fall was on the way when Guthlack arrived at the cursed island. It was August 25th, the feast of the Apostle St. Bartholomew, and the final year of the 7th century A.D. Guthlack would be here all winter, and many winters after that. The fishermen had tried to warn him. They were in the Fens, the vast swamplands that once existed in the east of England. The Angles and Saxons who had invaded England found the place unsettling. They had long ago driven the Britons west into modern Wales, but some of their old enemies still lived here, hidden in the fens. And who knew what else might crawl out of the dark water? A century before, so it was said, something had come howling out of the fens of the north, A fiend out of hell, descended from Cain's clan. Grendel was the name of this grim demon haunting the marshes, marauding round the heath and the desolate fens. It had taken the hero Beowulf to stop Grendel. Beowulf had pursued Grendel back to the dark waters and plunged into them himself to face Grendel's mother. Fens were dangerous. But even in the English fens, one island stood out. No one had ever been able to settle on the island of Crowland, or Croyland, a little north of modern Peterborough. That place was evil. It was where Guthlack was determined to go. Guthlack had not always been a monk. Guthlack was a descendant of kings, tracing his ancestry back to Ickel, son of Eomer. Ickel had led his people, the Angles, west across the sea to carve out a new kingdom. The Angles had settled on the east coast of England, giving their name to the region they settled, Anglia, but also to the island as a whole, Angleland. Guthlack grew up in a Christian family, but the stories of the heroes set his imagination aflame. They were men like Beowulf, and among the great men of the past were many of his own ancestors. As he entered his teenage years, Guthlack yearned to pile up glory for himself, as his ancestors had done, so that poets would sing his name for centuries too. And so, he went to make his name in war. Finding a war was not too difficult. The Angles and Saxons had been fighting the Celtic Britons for a very long time. The Britons had been mostly pushed into modern Wales, but the borders were not yet firm. King Offa had not yet built the long earthen wall, Offa's dyke, that separates England from Wales. Warriors could still seek glory in the contested lands to the west, along the modern Welsh border, and that was where Guthlack was headed. Guthlack turned out to be good at war, Soon, he was having enough success that his war band filled up with men who were not his relatives. Any noble might bring his kin to the battlefield, but a great leader attracted those who fought for gold or glory. Now in his early twenties, Guthlack was getting both. We don't know the details of Guthlack's war. The Britons of this time were not passive victims, and led out by men like St. Tudrig, They won battles as well as lost them. 
we know that they captured Guthlak at least once. Somehow, Guthlak made his escape. We also know that he wreaked bloody vengeance on those who had captured him, raiding and burning until his enemies begged for peace. When he had achieved the glorious overthrow of his persecutors, foes, and adversaries, by frequent blows and devastations, at last their strength was exhausted after all the pillage, slaughter, and plundering which their arms had wrought, and being worn out, they kept the peace. Guthlak's earliest biographer, Brother Felix, is noticeably uncomfortable in telling this part of the story. He goes out of his way to show that Guthlak was not such a bad man as you might think, insisting that Guthlak returned a third of what he plundered to the people he had just raided. Guthlak, however, was fully aware that many of the things he did were wrong. Guthlak was 24 years old. He had fought the enemy to a standstill and built up a war band. This could be the beginning of a great career, one that might see him become a powerful lord or even a king. And yet, Guthlak couldn't stop thinking about a verse from the Gospel according to Matthew. It was something that Jesus had said in the troubling passage we call the Olivet Discourse, which many believe to be a description of the doom that was soon to come upon the inhabitants of Judea. The Romans would destroy Jerusalem and expel the inhabitants, unintentionally spreading Christianity through the empire. But for those who were there, it would be a terrible time. Jesus had told his followers to be ready. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. The words had stuck in Guthlak's mind. Perhaps it was because he was a raider. The skillful raider waited until his enemies were comfortable and immobile when weather or circumstance made it hard for them to escape. That was when he struck. But as Guthlak thought about his own life, it occurred to him that he was as complacent as the men he raided. He assumed there would be plenty of time to get right with God when he was an old man. But would there be? Death was a raider too, and Guthlak had done many things that pressed down on his conscience. One day, Guthlak found that he could not go on. He handed command to one of his captains and left the war band that he had built. Guthlak rode east. At Repton, north of modern Birmingham, Guthlak found a monastery. He asked to be admitted as a novice. Guthlak was not yet the man he wanted to be. But in the characteristics of the monks around him, he could see the traits he wished he had. And so Guthlak's method, as his biographer notes, was to regard every monk as a teacher. Everyone had at least one trait that Guthlak wanted to learn. Some monks could teach him humility. Others could teach obedience, or abstinence, or easygoingness, or an open-hearted approach to life. The experience was humbling. In these dark ages, Monasteries were the only centers of learning. They had preserved the memory of how to read and write, and monks copied and recopied the precious Latin texts that were their links to the teaching of the church and the wisdom of pagan Greece and Rome. Guthlak learned to read. As Guthlak read, he encountered another kind of heroism. He read about the Desert Fathers, the first hermit monks who had sought out God in the deserts of Egypt. Deserts were dangerous, filled with bandits and wild animals. Jesus himself had said that evil spirits wander through desert places. And yet, this had been the battleground that the Desert Fathers had chosen. Guthlak began to feel the tug of a similar calling. But where was he going to find a desert in England? As he turned the matter over in his mind, Guthlak realized that he did know of a desolate, haunted place. It was the Fens. 
Guthlack spoke to his superiors about this calling. They gave him their blessing. And so Guthlack left the monastery and traveled to the villages of the fishermen who worked in the fens. They told him about the island of Crowland. He wouldn't be the first man to try to stay there. But Crowland was an evil place, and it never stayed occupied for long. And so it was that on the feast of St. Bartholomew, in the year 699, a fisherman dropped Guthlack off on the island of Crowland. Guthlack had an immediate sense that this was where he was supposed to be. He set out to explore the island. It didn't take Guthlack long to find something strange. It was a barrow. The barrow was an artificial hill that had been raised over a tomb. Indo-European peoples had been burying their lords in barrows for thousands of years. The Celts thought such mounds were, sometimes, places where our world connected to the other world of the Fae. And, to make matters worse, Guthlack found that this barrow had been desecrated. Grave robbers had dug into the barrow, looted the tomb, and thrown away the bones of whatever ancient king had rested there. Now, the barrow had a passage dug into it, and at the center was a large stone sarcophagus. If any place was cursed, this would be it. But Guthlack had come to live in a bad place. He prayed, and since he had arrived on St. Bartholomew's Day, he decided to enlist the help of the saint as well, asking for the saint's patronage in what he would do next. Guthlack built his hermit's hut in the sarcophagus, using the stone and the barrow as pre-existent materials. He knew that this place would test him. Even so, when the first test arrived, it was so subtle that it caught Guthlack by surprise. As Guthlack lived his simple hermit life, the realization began to dawn on him that he had done everything wrong. He was in the wrong place. He had never been called to this. And anyway, it was a waste of time. God would never forgive the sins of his bloody past. What had he been thinking? His sins were beyond forgiveness. Guthlack wrestled with these thoughts of despair until, one day, he realized they were not really his thoughts. He prayed and asked St. Bartholomew to pray along with him. The feelings of despair disappeared as quickly as they had come. Over the next years, Guthlack would wage a quiet war for holiness, and would face a series of demonic attacks. All of them were strange. On one occasion, the demons appeared as wild animals. On another, they appeared as an army of his old enemies, the Britons their ranks fading away as Guthlack prayed. But the encounter for which Guthlack would be best known well into the Middle Ages was an all-out assault. On this occasion, Guthlack was in his hermitage when vast numbers of evil things began to crawl and flap toward him. Brother Felix, his biographer, describes the scene. They were ferocious in appearance, terrible in shape, with great heads, long necks, thin faces, yellow complexions, filthy beards, shaggy ears, wild foreheads, fierce eyes, foul mouths, horses' teeth, throats vomiting flames, twisted jaws, thick lips, strident voices, singed hair, fat cheeks, pigeon breasts, scabby thighs, knotty knees, crooked legs, swollen ankles, splay feet, spreading mouths, raucous cries. Guthlack felt himself grabbed and dragged, then lifted up and carried through the air. Guthlack knew that this was an attempt to force him to leave Crowland, so he replied with the words of Psalm 16, The Lord is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. The army of demons responded by giving Guthlack a vision of hell gaping before him and telling him that they could easily take him there with them. This was what Guthlack had feared years ago as a warlord. 
but since then, he had made preparations. And he had found allies. The former raider held his ground. But, as they said these and many other things like them, the man of God despised their threats, and with unshaken nerves, with steadfast heart and sober mind, he answered them, Woe unto you, you sons of darkness, seed of Cain, you are but dust and ashes. If it is in your power to deliver me into these tortures, lo, I am ready. So, why utter these empty threats from your lying throats? Guthlak had called their bluff, and help was on the way. In Guthlak's vision, St. Bartholomew appeared, coming to his assistance. A later tradition has it that St. Bartholomew gave Guthlak a whip, and told him to use it on any demons who troubled him afterwards. And so, Guthlak remained in his hermitage. As he overcame these tests and temptations, the area around him began to change. Visitors began to describe a man who lived in the rhythms of nature. Guthlak told them that any man who loved God would soon find that animals loved him too, for all of nature was oriented toward its creator. Well, almost all of nature. Brother Felix devotes a long section to telling the story of Guthlak's only remaining enemies on the island. There were in this same island two jackdaws, whose mischievous nature was such that whatever they could break, drop into the water, tear in pieces, steal or defile, they would destroy, damaging everything without any respect. For they ventured into houses with, as it were, daring familiarity and seize everything they could find inside and out like shameless robbers. As Guthlak's fame grew, more visitors came to what had once been the cursed island of Crowland. They asked for Guthlak's help and his advice. And even though they were the ones coming to ask for help from him, visitors often found the hermit patiently waiting by the shore when their boat came into sight. Guthlak cast out demons, He healed the sick. He was humble and gentle, though visitors were sometimes disconcerted when he spoke to them about things they had done while they were still far away. Guthlak's gift of supernatural insight had more mundane uses as well. When visitors left their possessions unattended, only to be robbed by the jackdaws, Guthlak would resignedly think it over, and then announce where the sneaky corvids had hidden the things this time. A small community was forming around Guthlak. Soon, his fame had spread beyond the surrounding area. The church began to take note. Someone asked Guthlak if he had given any thought to succession. Of course, Guthlak said. The next leader would be Sissa. The questioner had never heard of a Christian named Sissa. Guthlak explained that Sissa wasn't a Christian. Yet. Guthlak had set out to find glory, then given up on that path. Now, fame had come to him. Nobles came to the island to ask for advice. The Lord Ethelbald, in hiding from the evil king Chelred, came to Guthlak to find out what to do next. Chelred's descent into madness and self-destruction was still a few years in the future, but Guthlak reassured and encouraged Ethelbald. He needed to hang on, and he would be king in due time. The church sent a bishop to Crowland to ordain Guthlak a priest. The bishop happened to arrive just in time to let Guthlak celebrate Mass on the feast of St. Bartholomew. In the year 714, when Guthlak was in his early forties, he became very sick. One of the monks asked him what was wrong. Guthlak knew that there would be no recovery. Brother Felix records Guthlak's gentle, half-teasing response. My son, the cause of my sickness is that my spirit is leaving this body, and the end of my sickness will be on the eighth day, when 
Having finished the course of this life, I must be released and be with Christ. For it is fitting that I should put off the burden of the flesh and follow the Lamb of God. Guthlach prepared his monks with instructions for what would happen after his death. As soon as he was dead, he said, one of them would have to make a journey. The monk would need to find Guthlach's sister, who would arrange for the burial. This would set into motion a series of events. Miracles would soon be reported. Guthlach's body would remain incorrupt. A pagan named Sissa would indeed be baptized, and would arrive at Crowland to become the next leader of the monks there. Athelbald would be crowned king, as Guthlach had predicted, and he would remember the community on Crowland and honor Guthlach's memory. The little community would power along with not only St. Bartholomew, but now also St. Guthlach praying for it. And before long, it would be a big community, and the Abbey of Crowland, built on the cursed island, would become one of the great monasteries of the Middle Ages. All of this was in the future, as Guthlach's illness came into its eighth day. One of his monks, outside, was startled to see the hermitage suddenly illuminated as light poured out of the doors and windows. There was a sound of singing on the breeze. The monk understood. He climbed into the little boat and began his journey. 